I guess uh, homework one is done. I hope it was uh, as easy as I hoped it was. Um, the good news is there's another homework that will be available today. I don't know if it's good or bad, it's news. Um, there'll be homework two that will be available sometime today and it will, it's again, you get two weeks for it. Uh, this will cover uh, linear models. It will talk about, it will deal with uh, mistake bound learning, which we will cover today. And uh, in the experiment part, you'll be implementing the perceptron algorithm and some of its variants and doing experiments with uh, cross validation and all that good stuff. You'll be covering perceptron starting Tuesday. Uh, there are no real updates on the project yet, other than the fact that because there are no updates, I've moved the first project milestone to the 20th of February. Um, I'm hoping to have information sometime through this week, uh, definitely before the next lecture. Any questions? Anything that, uh, any, any questions about homeworks or projects and such things? Yeah. Uh, what's the first milestone? The first milestone for the project. Okay, I can tell you about this. So the project is uh, will involve all of you working on a shared task. I'll be giving you all a data set and uh, you'll all be working on the same data set and uh, it, it's the same project for everyone. And you'll be you'll you'll get a training set, you'll get a test set that you can evaluate on locally, and you'll get a third set which I'm calling evaluation. So you'll train your models on the training data, do cross validation and all that stuff, and then use the model to make predictions on the evaluation set for which I will not give you labels, and upload the labels to Kaggle.com. And Kaggle.com will evaluate your uh, labels because I've, I will set it up so that it knows how to evaluate it. And uh, everyone will be placed on a leaderboard. Um, and you'll be submitting over the course of the semester, you'll have to submit uh, at least six different, uh, uh, six different submissions subject to some constraints. Now, the first milestone is perhaps the most important milestone for this entire thing, which is uh, you'll have to click the link that I provide on Canvas. Go to Kaggle, create an account there. If you don't have one already, log in, download a data set, and uh, submit and you know unzip the file, and then upload one of the files that we give you to Kaggle, an evaluation, dummy evaluation, and it will tell you the accuracy of that thing. And in your report, in on, on back on Canvas, you have to submit your Kaggle username and whatever Kaggle tells you is the accuracy of the dummy data. This way we have the pipeline set up. So it's the most important uh, assignment because it's the most important milestone because uh, without it, I will not be able to grade anything else that you submit for, uh, for this project because I will need your Kaggle ID for this thing. Okay, it's super simple. It will involve like 15 to 20 minutes of your time, however long it takes to download, unzip a file and then uh, uh, upload a file back. Um, so it's a very simple milestone, but uh, the most important part of that is you need the data set, and that's what we are working on pre-processing. Does that? Okay. Um, any other questions? And there'll be more details on this and the mechanics of this and uh, as we go along. If there are no questions, we're going to continue where we left off. In the last lecture, we were talking about online learning, and in particular, a version of online learning called mistake-driven learning. Mistake-driven learning is a protocol for learning which proceeds in multiple rounds. At each step, the learner sees an input, just one input. Let's call it X. Internally, the learner maintains a hypothesis XP. This is the T uh, um, hypothesis that it has it uh, it has in its uh, internally, and uh, it sees the example X and it makes a prediction HT of X. After it makes the prediction, it receives the true label for that input from nature, and then it can internally compare, was the prediction right? If the prediction was wrong, then the learner updates its internal hypothesis from HT to HT plus one. And that's the end of this round, and uh, the learner is now ready for the next input whenever it shows up. So this is called online learning because in some sense, learning is happening 
over the course of the lifetime of the model, there's no separate training phase and testing phase and such thing. There's just one thing. There's a think of this as a robot that's going around, making predictions, getting feedback, and fixing itself, and then continuing its explorations. And it's a very, very simple scheme because this is pretty much the outline of any mistake-driven learning algorithm. Um, of course, there are two important things here are how do you make a prediction and how do you make an update? And you know, we'll get to that later. Uh, and uh, the question to think about, and we'll be talking about this today, is can, can we learn anything non-trivial even though it's such a simple scheme? And the second question is, what does it mean to learn in this in this setting? Okay. Uh, the goal today is we will formalize this setting, and then I will uh, talk about um, uh, you know I, I'll give you some examples just to prove to you that this setting is not uh, a, you know a, a trivial thing that does not there, there are I'll I'll show you a couple of algorithms which actually do operate in this setting. Then I'll argue that those algorithms are impractical. And then, but they allow you to kind of say, make theoretical claims about concept classes without actually implementing anything. That's the plan for today. Any questions? Any questions about this uh, uh, general scheme of an online learner? Yes. Do you know how to turn off the light above the screen? I know how to turn off the light. Um, um, it involves playing with these switches. <laughs> and I also know that these labels on the switches are just there to confuse me <laughs> so i'm gonna try what's your best algorithm for finding that switch uh, i try everything there are five switches and two power five combinations <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately it leaves many of you in the dark and i don't like that is this okay is this better than what it was before Dark. It's a little dark. Um, try not to sleep. Okay, let's get back to this. Any questions about online learning? Any questions about uh, the, this protocol or about why this might actually uh, be an interesting thing? If not, I'm going to continue where we left off. This is where we stopped at the last lecture. We'll pick up from here. So I'm going to formalize the notion of a mistake bound algorithm. So we have an instance space. And that instance space, following our usual convention, is this um, is x, actually chi, but let's just call it x. And uh, the dimensionality of this instance space is n. That means that there are n features uh, that, that are used to define every example. There's a function f that we seek to learn. This function takes uh, any instance in the instance space to a true or a false, a zero or a one. This function f, let's say we know that this function f belongs to a set of functions called c, the concept class. This is the set that contains the true, uh, the, the true function. And the size of the concept class is going to depend on the dimensionality. Uh, for now, let, if, if that is not immediately obvious, uh, we'll see some examples where it becomes clear that the size of the concept class is uh, uh, depends on the dimensionality. There's a question on Zoom. I'll get back to that after I finish this. Now, the learning protocol, this is just a two uh, po a bullet point summary of the same thing that we saw before. Learning proceeds in rounds. At each round, the learner is provided with some example X that is perhaps randomly chosen. And it could be randomly chosen. It could actually be adversarially chosen, which means imagine that there is a, a, an adversarial agent that knows everything about the learner and decides to pick the worst example to the, that'll, that's guaranteed to pull the learner at any, any step. This learning protocol allows for that. It allows for an adversary choosing the examples. For now, let's just say it's randomly chosen. And once the learner is presented with an example, it will predict the label. After it predicts the label, it uh, gets the feedback. The predicted label is H of X. H is a hypothesis that's currently entertained by uh, the learner. And after the, after 
the learner commits to a certain label, then nature reveals the true label, which is f of x. This is the feedback. And then the, the learner chooses to do whatever it wants with that feedback. It can choose to ignore the feedback, or it can choose to update itself if there's a mistake, or it can do something else. One way or another, in terms of uh, uh, you know, the, how we measure the success is by asking, the, has the learner made a mistake? A mistake is simply defined as the case where the prediction h of x is different from the ground truth f of x. So far, so good. So the important point here, this is a this is a simpler form of uh, a broader class of uh, a broader setting called online learning. In this case, the only thing that matters is we want the learner not to make any more mistakes or not to make mistakes in the future. So a natural thing to count uh, is the number of mistakes made by some algorithm. The learner learning algorithm is A. The number of mistakes made by the learning algorithm on a sequence of examples, provided the true concept is some function f. So you imagine that the true function is f. Let's say it's fixed. And imagine that we somehow, in hindsight, we look back and say, this was the sequence of examples that showed up. And we record every instance of mistakes that were made. We can count how many mistakes were made on the sequence. right? I'm going to call this m uh, sub a of f comma s. So as an illustration, you have a sequence of uh, nine examples, probably more, and there was a mistake on example zero, two, four, yes. There was a mistake here, 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 and here, and every other prediction was right. So the number of mistakes is four. That's on this particular sequence of uh, examples that was presented to the learner. Maybe the same, uh, you know, if, if you ran the whole thing again, maybe a different sequence of examples showed up because the examples are randomly chosen. So different runs might produce a different number of mistakes. So uh, in this run here, sequence number three, there are only three mistakes that occur clustered here. Right? Different runs can produce different number of mistakes. So for the same concept class, F, the algorithm might encounter different sequences of examples if in, in different universes, if it's uh, running in different uh, places. So uh, before I move on, any questions? Yes. What's the relationship between H and A? H and what? A, like you say. H is the hypothesis, the the, the classifier that the learner is uh, inter, uh, internally storing. A is the algorithm that is uh, that includes things like what's the hypothesis, but also things like how to make the update. So the, I'll answer the question on Zoom. In mistake-driven learning, can future data contradict prior data? For now, let's pretend that it cannot. Let's pretend that there is this true target function. There's this one target function that is fixed, and the, the future data has to, uh, you know, there's no noise. The target function will uh, predict what it predicts, and you can't change the target. Yes, there's another question. Hello. So what we're saying here is we have 10 examples mm -hmm. and depending on the order we present the examples in, we may make more or fewer That's right. Okay. Depending on the order in which we present the examples, there may be more or fewer mistakes simply because maybe if uh, there's a good order that allows the learner to make a few mistakes early on and then it has, quote unquote, learned the concept and it never makes mistakes after that. Or maybe there's a bad order that uh, does not really reveal the true target function in any meaningful way. And so it keeps forcing the learner to make mistakes. So different orderings of these uh, examples might force more or less number of mistakes. Are there other questions? Questions on Zoom, perhaps? Yes. In the case of the definition B, is H the tree and A is the IDP algorithm? Mm, I wouldn't. So, Almost the decision tree ID3 algorithm in particular is not an online learn. The ID3 algorithm does not update itself after seeing the next example. It's a batch algorithm because it sees a collection of examples and it just compute aggregate statistics based on that. Here we are, the, remember the protocol here is the learner encounters uh, data one example at a time. In ID3, the learner encountered the data in one batch. Mm -hmm. 
However, you can think of H as the decision tree. H could be a decision tree. Maybe there's an online learning, learning algorithm for a decision tree. Okay, ah, yes. We don't, they, we don't have multiple sequences in reality. The learner just goes through one sequence, that's it. There's only one sequence. The learner does not go to go from one. Each of these is a different run of the algorithm. So the learner encounters one sequence, and this is a lifelong learning thing. So it keeps encountering a, a, an example, a, an update, possible update, and it moves on. The, so this, these are all different runs of the algorithm. And we are going to evaluate one run. Now, instead of thinking of going from one sequence to another, which we don't, which the learner does not have the luxury to do, let's think of it in a slightly different way. Different sequences can force different number of mistakes. So presumably, there is this one sequence that can force the learner to make a lot more mistakes than some other thing. So there are some sequences that are bad, right? So for, and that, the, the, the badness depends on that function f. Different target functions will have different bad sequences. Some functions might have, might be very easy. So uh, it, it does not require too many function, uh, mistakes to learn. And some functions might be very hard to learn. As a result, there might be a really bad sequence of examples that force the learner to make more mistakes. So I'm going to aggregate all of these things into a different concept. I'm calling that M A of C. This is the worst case. Imagine the most difficult function f inside the, this should not be in s, this should be in c. Imagine the most difficult function in the concept class. For that most difficult function, imagine the most, the worst possible sequence of examples here. So for in the concept class, you pick the most difficult function, Imagine that nature decides, okay, let's say, we'll think about it differently. Nature controls what is the target function. Nature controls what is the sequence of examples that are presented. And imagine that nature is being adversarial. So nature decides your learner is going to encounter the most difficult function in the concept class. And your learner is going to encounter the most adversarial sequence of examples for the most difficult function. For that really difficult setting, we can ask what's the number of mistakes that it makes, right? So that is a property of the concept class. It's the worst sequence provided to the worst function, the number of mistakes that it makes. That I'm calling, I'm calling that uh, M A of C. This is the maximum number of mistakes that could be made by this algorithm on this concept class. Questions? Yes? What are the most difficult functions? Um, it, <laughs> I'm just using that as a uh, as a as an illustration. Different algorithms might have different most difficult functions. I'll give you a very very um, simple thing. Imagine that there is an algorithm that somehow this uh, if the true function was f one some function internally it ha it it keeps randomly guessing uh, till it finds accidentally the right one. Otherwise, inside that learning algorithm. There's an oracle that just says, here's the answer. I mean, that makes no sense, but you know, imagine that. So in that case, the most difficult function would be F1 because it has to keep making many mistakes before it finds the answer. So there might be other examples where there's the function, we, we'll see some instances. There might be a, other uh, 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 concept classes where some functions are harder to find than others. Remember, learning is search over functions. Because learning is search over functions, some Elements in the search space, namely the concept class, might take more number of steps to get them. That's the most difficult part. So, yes. No, no. The, the previous runs of the uh, previous uh, runs of this algorithm. Uh, don't matter. In this particular run, is the only thing that uh, that's the only count you keep. Okay, so we have this concept, this this idea 
of the number of mistakes, the worst case number of mistakes made by this algorithm for this entire concept class. And this is a property of the concept class. So this is a property of the pair of the concept class and the algorithm, right? So I claim that an algorithm A, I'm, I'm, I'm not claiming, I'm kind of naming an algorithm A to be a mistake bound algorithm. If for the concept class C, even the worst case number of mistakes it makes is only a polynomial in the dimensionality of the input. Even in the worst case, the number of mistakes it makes is no more than a polynomial. But those of you who are not comfortable thinking in terms of the sort of polynomial complexity class, basically polynomial means it's okay. It's not exponential. It's not terrible. So even in the worst case, even in the, the, the most difficult number of, the most difficult, even for the most difficult function in the concept class, even for the worst sequence of examples that's presented, this algorithm will make no more than a polynomial number of mistakes and the polynomial is in the dimensionality. If that happens, then I'm going to assign a tag to this algorithm and say, this is a mistake bound algorithm. I'm just making, I'm just giving you a definition here. Maybe this is a, uh, this is a useless definition because uh, maybe no algorithm in the universe has this property. And of course that's not true because I'll show you some examples of mistake bound algorithm, but I just want you to know that this is a definition. This definition could be characterizing an empty set. It's not, but it could be. It's just a definition. Okay. Any questions about this? For, I, I don't know anything about dimensionality reduction here. All of that maybe is inside the learner. So it's in the original dimensionality. In the dimensionality that is intrinsic to the problem, however you define. Um, I saw you first and then you. Yeah. I understand the dimensionality as a manual Yes. That's exactly what it is. Yes. So just to uh, repeat that, by dimensionality, I mean the number of features. Yeah. Does this also work with regression? Um, that's why I cleverly set it up so that it's for binary classification. So it's specifically for classification. At least the, the specific theory that we are developing here is for classification. There are online algorithms for regression where you don't count mistakes this way. You count mistakes, you 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 have a you, you take like the squared difference or something like that. I thought I saw another hand somewhere, but maybe I missed it. Yeah. So it's polynomial, but can your instance space be infinite? So it like it, it, it could. Um, okay. But wait one minute. What do you mean by can your instance space be infinite? Infinite dimensional or infinite number of examples? Like there's an infinite number of possible like instances and you can uh, like. like in the infinite number of instances. instances. That's fine. That's fine. But the, this is the dimensionality. This is the number of features. Okay, it's just the number. Yeah, yeah. That by dimensionality, I always mean the number of features. Yes. It's a number. Yes. But if it's a number, yes. For if you're thinking of this empirically, it's a number. But if I'm thinking of it theoretically, I can prove, we will prove certain cases where given a certain concept class and given a certain algorithm, symbolically, I'll be able to derive the number of mistakes that the algorithm makes. And if that number is a polynomial in the dimensionality, we give it that time. It's a mistake bound algorithm. So this is a symbol. This is in some sense a symbolic thing. I I introduce the number of mistakes and such things empirically just to kind of give you the mental model of what it is. But we'll be proving things. So essentially, if MAC has a polynomial relationship, has a polynomial relationship, then it's a mistake. Yeah. So it's something like M A. 
of C is order of it's some polynomial function in it, order of n power some k, sort of some k. Uh, th there's another question. So um, if there are three features, does this mean the polynomial would be at most x cubed? It's more like three. If there are three features, then you have three power some k. It will be a polynomial uh, in k. Other questions. So for instance, three power three square, if you have n features, n square is a polynomial, and so is n power. That's also a polynomial. Yeah. It's just a horrible polynomial. It's a very large number of mistakes, but at least it is not two power x. Because that is always going to be bigger than any polynomial. Okay, so I've just defined a class of algorithms. A class of algorithms is uh, given this tag of being a mistake bound algorithm if its number of mistakes it makes is polynomial. Um, sorry. Uh, the, the other question is ah, this is an interesting question. This is a polynomial just in the provided features rather than the relevant features. Yes, this is an important point. This is a polynomial only in all the features that are available to the problem, not necessarily in the number of relevant features. Eventually, we'll ask the question, can we make it polynomial in the number of relevant features? And it turns out that that becomes a little bit tricky. So this is the same thing. I've just taken the uh, up in the slide. So this is a mistake bound algorithm. I can also ask, uh, the, you know, for a concept class. You know, let's say I give you a concept class, a set of functions, like say all Boolean functions, or maybe the set of Boolean uh, conjunctions, or maybe all linearly separable functions, or something like that. I could ask, does it, does, is there at least one algorithm that is a mistake bound algorithm for that set of functions that can learn that set of functions with only a polynomial number of mistakes? If that is the case, then we say that the concept class is learnable. Under the mistake bound model, um, if it if there exists even one algorithm that is guaranteed to make no more than a polynomial number of mistakes, polynomial in the dimensionality again. So the definition on top is a property of the algorithm with respect to the concept class. It says the algorithm is a mistake bound algorithm if it makes no more than a polynomial number of mistakes. The definition of at the bottom is a property of a concept class. It says this concept class is learnable in the mistake bound model. If even one algorithm exists, that's a mistake bound algorithm. And just building definitions here. Once again, this is uh, uh, the standard thing that we do in theory. We define things and hope that these definitions are not trivial, um, meaning these definitions don't represent the empty set. I'm going to I'm, I'm going to show that there is. There are at least some concept classes that are learnable in the mistake bound model. And there are some algorithms that are mistake bound algorithms for interesting concept classes. But for now, I'm just showing you definitions. Questions? If there aren't any, let's have some, uh, uh, let's kind of stare at this a little bit more. By the way, this is not the most general setting for online learning. Um, and the notion of uh, mistake, counting mistakes, is not even the most general metric. Uh, if you want to kind of uh, 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 read more about this, look up notions of regret or things like cumulative loss. These things are generalizations of this idea of uh, defining success. Here we are defining success as the algorithm is going to stop making mistakes after a certain point. After making these many mistakes, this algorithm will never make any more mistakes in the future. And that's the mistake box. But there are, uh, if, you, if you're interested, look up regret and uh, cumulative loss. But we, we won't go there. Um, let's have a, let's, let's stare at online learning a little bit more. Online learning is, is a distribution free uh, thing. Meaning it makes no assumption that examples have a certain distribution. Examples come from a certain probability distribution. Examples are not presented in any sort of a favorable order. An adversary could be choosing uh, the example, and it doesn't really matter because the example, the learning algorithm, 
does exactly the same thing no matter what happens. It sees an example that makes a prediction and then the true label is revealed. The learner doesn't get to control how the example, he doesn't get to ask, now show me an example of this kind. It's a very simple uh, model. Yeah. No, you get to see one data point at once, just one. There may be slight extensions where you see a small number, but that's it. It's a, for now, you see one example at a time. There is no concept of a data set. The learner sees an example, it makes a prediction, gets the feedback, tosses out the example. It doesn't have memory. It tosses out the example. Now it waits for the next example to show up. That's it. That's the entire learning algorithm. And mistake bound learning is a specific instance of online learning where we count the number of mistakes. This is a rather simple model. Or when I say modeling here, I mean uh, a framework to define what learnability means. This is a rather simple model for learnability. And yet it actually is widely applicable when we want our learners to go out in the world, explore, get feedback, and adapt on the fly. Um, it also kind of makes sense if you're learning uh, with such a large data set that you can't load everything into memory. So you have to actually go through, uh, uh, you have to operate in a streaming setting. Uh, any sort of a learning framework, we have to think about what evaluation is and uh, what the, how we define successful learning. In mistake-bound learning, we define success as the learner stops making mistakes after a certain number of, after a certain Threshold after that, there are no mistakes that uh, exist. So something to think about is uh, in the first lecture, I talked about the real goal of machine learning is generalization. It's worth thinking about whether this simple uh, framework captures the notion of generalization. I think it does because uh, we are talking about making predictions. Imagine that you have a mistake bound algorithm. The mistake bound algorithm is going to stop making mistakes after a certain point. Which means future examples will come in because the theory tells me that it's going to stop making mistakes. Future examples will be predicted correctly. Um, also, uh, this is this, this answers the second question also. Online learning, if it exists, if there are algorithms that are mistake bound learners, they will do well on previously unseen data because the guarantee is not about any distribution of data of examples. It's just on any future examples, no matter what you, where they are from, there will be no more mistakes. That's a very, very rigorous uh, assumption. That, that's a very rigorous requirement because it doesn't matter where the examples come from. If you have a theorem that says this algorithm is going to stop making mistakes, it's a mathematical certainty that there will be no more mistakes. So that's a very strong ask. And yet it turns out there are algorithms that have that property. Um, it's a worst case setting, meaning we are assuming we are making no assumptions about the sequence in which examples show up. Uh, oh, there's a question. Is online learning the same as uh, mistake-driven learning? Mistake-driven learning is a special instance of online learning. Um, there's very little memory requirement here because you don't need to have a large amount of memory to store a big data set and such things. You can just, you see an example, you make an update, you discard the example. On the other hand, maybe it or rather it's too simple as a result, while we may say that we may, the, the notion of a mistake bound might uh, theoretically guarantee that a certain algorithm will make no more than say 100 mistakes. There's no, uh, the, the theory does not say when those 100 mistakes will happen. So this is kind of, this could be problematic. Imagine that I give you a self-driving car and the self-driving car is learned in the online model and uh, a mistake, is defined as whenever the car hits somebody. <laughs> it's a bit strong, but uh, let's go there. Um, and I tell you that this car comes with a theory uh, with the theorem that says this car will make uh, no more than a hundred mistakes. And let's say ninety-nine of them are done inside the uh, playground where there are like these mannequins that the car hits. And they like, there's one more mistake left. After that one mistake, life is good. But maybe that one mistake comes 10,000 years later. 
Will you be willing to take that car? So we don't know when the mistake will happen. All we know is that there are 100 mistakes or a fixed number of mistakes. No. And on the other hand, even in the simple setting, already we can prove some important or interesting guarantees. One interesting guarantee that we'll prove is uh, about certain classes of functions that just cannot be learned. It is impossible to learn certain classes of functions under this model, which it turns out translates because of the third point there. There are standard translation or uh, you know conversion mechanisms for taking any guarantees we get here to generalization guarantees. So that means that anything that you prove is not learnable here, cannot be learned using other learning frameworks also. So the, even though this is a simple model for learning, it allows you to prove things about more complicated things, complicated uh, uh, learning definitions. The other thing to think about is, uh, is it enough um, to count the number of mistakes? It's easy for a learner to kind of accidentally convince itself that it's doing well if it turns out that nature is not being too adversarial. Imagine that your learner ended up in a in, uh, sweet spot where nature keeps giving the same example again and again. So it sees an example, makes a mistake, and somehow it remembers the label for that example. And then the next example is the same, same data point. It doesn't make a mistake anymore because it gets the right label. And then it doesn't make a mistake again. It never makes a mistake because the nature has decided to be friendly with the learner. It can fool us into thinking that we are doing well when in fact, the learner is actually just not learning anything. It's just seeing one example. So it might actually, the idea of counting mistakes may or may not be good. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, this particular problem later on. Okay, I, I want to kind of uh, uh, move into a proof of concept thing that there exists at least one algorithm that is a mistake bound algorithm. So far, all we have done is just uh, you know, a conceptual uh, overview of or, or definition of what mistake bound learning is. So now I'm going to talk about a proof of concept. Just because I define a, a certain thing doesn't mean that that should exist. Just because I say that an algorithm is called a mistake bound model if it satisfies certain properties does not mean that there should be any algorithm out there that satisfies those properties. I'll prove to you that there is a certain algorithm that is uh, that satisfies the properties of a mistake bound algorithm. And this is called the halving algorithm. The halving algorithm is this proof of concept because it's you should never implement it. You cannot implement it. In fact, it turns out it's a, uh, it, it hides an exponential inside. But at least it, it uh, satisfies the conditions that uh, make it a mistake bound algorithm. So to before we move on, is everyone on board? Any questions about where we are going? Or about how we got here? One. So let's. Uh, I'm going to introduce some notation. Suppose we have a concept class C, and for now, let's say the concept class is finite. This is an important point. It's a finite set of functions, and there's this one function f inside the C inside the concept class that nature has just picked uh, as the target function. The first. Uh, Proof of concept algorithm I will introduce is not halving, but an even simpler thing called con, short for consistent. It learning proceeds in round. It's a mistake on uh, mistake driven algorithm, so learning proceeds in round. At each step, what it does, it's uh, its internal sort of uh, memory. It means it keeps track of a subset C i of C. Um, the i is a set of functions that the learner keeps in memory. And this set is a set of functions that is consistent with all the previous examples that have been seen so far. Okay? Yes. That, that means correct the uh, prediction. What, what are the consistent? What it means is that all these functions agree, will make the predict the correct label on all the examples that were seen so far. 
So CI does that. CI is a function. It's a set of functions. A new example comes in, X. So what it, what this algorithm does is it chooses a random, let's call this H, a random function inside the current set that we have, and then uses that to make the prediction. And let's say that H of X is the ground truth. In which case, there's nothing to do. So let's, uh, let's consider two cases. H of X is correct. If h of x is f of x, by definition, the mistake-driven algorithm does not do anything. Because if there's no mistake, there's no update. So the only interesting part is if h of x is not equal to f of x. So then what it what you do is ci plus 1 is all h in, in ci such that h of x equals f of x. It only keeps those functions that are that would have correctly predicted the right way. Yes. Oh, my understanding. This should not be randomly choose because if you you need to keep consistent. I mean, you should use all the all the agents. You could, but that's a different algorithm. I'm defining an algorithm here. You can define a different algorithm. Oh, this is kind of like a, a approximation. No, it's not an approximation. There's no approximation. It's just picking that algorithm, that that edge. A random edge and making a prediction. Mm -hmm. And if the prediction is wrong, it removes all the functions in CI that are wrong. Yeah, you actually you, you try more than one, right? No, you try one. Just one. And how if, you know others will make you wrong? Okay, you could. They, why not? I, I'll show you an example. So in fact, let's uh, let's walk through an example here. So oh, this is a zoom question. Wouldn't it need to test other functions that weren't in use, even if it was correct. It could, and that's a different algorithm. And in fact, that is going to be the halving algorithm. This is uh, the first version of it where it doesn't do that. It just picks one of the functions. So let me give you an example. So let's say that my C is a set of functions, F0, F1, F2, and F3. Some four functions. and some example x comes in. So initially, I initialize c0 equals c. An example x comes in. And for this, let's say I pick f1. Then the algorithm randomly picks f1. And it makes a prediction f1 of x equals, um, and let's say the ground truth was f3. The true function was f3. So it picks f1, and let's say f1 of x equals 0. But we also know. For, uh, this is uh, uh, x1, the first example comes in. f1 of x1 is 0, but we also know that, you know what, let me just write down all the labels, uh, the, the predictions first. So the on x1, each of these functions make these predictions. So currently we are entertaining all four functions. Mm -hmm. And in round one, the the pick, the pick is f1. So f1 of x1 is zero, which means in the next round, this gets tossed out. So C. This is round. In round one. It, you remove all functions that are incorrect. So that you're left with, actually, you know what? Let me introduce. Oh, that's fine. So you remove all functions that are incorrect. So you are left with F0, F2, and F3. And that's the end of the round. So the prediction step picks a random function, and the update removes all functions that are incorrect. Yes? Is it F1 or F1 is no, the ground truth F three is the ground truth. Oh. F this is the this is the true function. Oh. So F the prediction is F zero. The true function predicts one. You toss out all the functions. In this case, just one, which is incorrect. That's the end of the first round. The next round, you're ready for the next round now. X two comes in, and let's just I, I'll finish this round and maybe we'll get there. And 
this thing that I'm writing in the middle right now is not available, but it's just for us. Let's say that we know uh, this part is gone. So now we have F0 predicts a zero, F1 predicts a one, and F3 predicts a one. And let's say we pick um, F2 of X2 is one. No mistake, no change. So we are still left with F0, F2, and F3. Yes. So for that choice of F1 and X1, are those just random? Those are picked randomly. And they are chosen randomly from the current set of functions. Okay, so now we have the third round and I'm going to just, I hope that uh, the game is becoming clearer. So X3 and let's say this is chosen, chosen. And let's say it randomly picks F0 of X3 is zero. And we are left, it's a mistake because the ground truth, no. No mistake. F0 of X3 is one because it's this thing here. Whereas the ground truth is this. So there's a mistake. So F2 and F, F0 and F2 gets tossed out. And we are left with F3. Learning continues till we are left with only one function. And there must be at least one function that's correct. Because that the, the two, we believe, we know that the two function is in the, uh, in the set C. Yes. In the round three, you only take the F0. How, how could you remove the F2? That's the same question as the one on Zoom. Yeah. Um, if you test only one function in the in the round, yeah. the definition of the algorithm is you remove you you at any round you only keep those functions that are consistent with all the examples that were seen so far, yeah. which means every function that is inconsistent gets tossed out. But then if you don't test, uh, you test all of them. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, but how how do you say? Randomly pick one. Actually, you don't pick one. You pick all of them. No, I make the so there are two parts to a mistake-driven algorithm. There's the prediction and the update. The prediction is done using a random chosen one. The update removes all of them that are incorrect. But that's in this prediction unanswered. That you 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 will do update anyway. So no, you. I don't do an update anyway. In this step, I did not do an update. Oh, if you might oh. yes. Since we only do an update whenever you find a wrong label. Yes, because it's a mistake-driven algorithm. Only if there's a mistake, do you do an algorithm. Do you do an update? Mm -hmm. Yes. No, it's not that because it's we are trying to define the computational properties of this particular class of learning algorithms, which only make updates on mistakes. Of course, I mean, obviously it makes sense to do something when there's no mistake because you can actually go faster. But yeah. other questions? Yes. Why did F2 go? Because the Prediction was that the ground truth is a zero. And I want to keep only from going from round three to maybe around four. I want to keep only those functions that are consistent with the ground truth. That's why the name is consistent. Con. So I every step, I only keep those functions that are consistent with the true name. So I'm basically just narrowing down at every step. Yes. For step two, um, F0 gives. Zero, which is different than other previous. But the update only happens if there's a mistake. It's, I mean, I didn't make the rules. This is the definition of the algorithm. This is the definition of the framework. Of course, you can make it better by topping out F0. It turns out you can't make it too much better. Uh, it's just a linear, it's a, it's a, yeah, it, it doesn't make too much of a difference. And that could be a good homework question. Well, huh? no, so what is the pick column here? Ah, good. So what is this column here and what does it represent? The Remember that a mistake driven algorithm has uh, the following steps. One, receive input. Or let's just say given an input. 
if i in this round step one is y equals predict if y equals correct yeah. then update so the pick function the pick column represents the prediction step you pick a random function and make a prediction and then the the c column represents the updated um, set of functions Okay, uh, let's go back to the where we were. The important thing here is to note that whether there's an update or no, not, C i plus one, the set of functions that are left after and put a possible update is going to be either a subset of C i or equal to C i. If there's no update, of course it's equal. By construction, it's equal to C i. If there is an update, you've removed at least one function because there's, there was some function that made a mistake, right? Mm -hmm. The randomly chosen function made a mistake, at least that one function gets removed. So there's progress. That means if a mistake is made, the uh, set CI plus one is strictly less than smaller than the set CI because at least one function uh, got removed. Now we can count the number of mistakes. How many mistakes can this, this algorithm make? At every step, imagine that at every mistake, only one function got removed. How many, how many mistakes can it possibly make? The number of, number of this number of functions in yeah. C, yeah. which we conveniently made finite, mm -hmm. minus one. Because there is one function that was correct. There was one function that's correct. Imagine that every one of those other uh, randomly chosen functions triggered, uh, sorry, uh, if, uh, every one of those, every one of the updates removed only one function, because that's the worst case. Okay. So the number of mistakes that can be made is at most the size of C minus one. Yeah. Any questions about this? Notice I've not proved anything about whether this is a mistake bound algorithm or not. I just left it at, as size of C. Now the size of C becomes important. If that's polynomial, we have a mistake bound algorithm. This is a mistake bound algorithm. If that's not, we don't. We'll apply that for uh, actual functions later on. Let me now um, argue that this is actually not a great algorithm. In fact, we can easily do better than this algorithm. And the update, the, 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 the new version of this is, uh, um, so by doing better, I mean, we can easily tweak this algorithm to a new, uh, to a variant that makes far fewer than the number of uh, mm -hmm. size of C minus one number of mistakes. And that's the hard now. Once again, we have C, C is a, finite concept class. And uh, the goal is to learn some function in C. There's some function that have been randomly chosen by nature as the target function. So learning proceeds in rounds. At each step, just like Harvey, we'll initialize, we'll keep track of a set of functions. At each step, uh, sorry, at the beginning, we'll start off with the set of functions being the entire concept class. That's C0. Learning keeps going on. We'll construct a series of sets of functions, just like we did with Pali. We'll continue this process till exactly one element remains in the state. At that point, that function has to be correct because S is in C. So the important point is how we construct the series of functions. So remember, any uh, mistake bound algorithm has two parts. When an example arrives, it needs to make a prediction and it needs to make an update. What having does is when an example arrives, it will call all the functions that are in the current set and ask them, what's the label on this example? And it will pick the majority label. If more than half the examples predict that the label is zero, then the prediction is zero. If more than half the examples predict that the label is one, the prediction is one. So 
if the majority of the functions in pi, so if for any, if, for if the number of functions that label h of x equals one is more than the number of functions that label uh, x as zero, then we'll say uh, the label is one. Otherwise, the label is zero. Okay. If this happens, it, 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 we make a prediction, and after that, we just wait for feedback. The true label is revealed, and if a mistake happens, then we update the set of functions. We will remove all the functions that were incorrect, just like with uh, uh, with the previous setting. If there's a mistake, we will get rid of all functions that are incorrect and only keep those functions that are consistent. So the only difference between having and con is how prediction is made. In con, the prediction was made by one randomly chosen example, or one randomly chosen function. In having, you take the most common label among all the possible functions. This is the entirety of the output. Questions? Can people see why this is a better algorithm than having than con? It, it looks uh, all the functions every time. Why should that be good? Why is that better in terms of number of mistakes? I'll go there first. Yeah. It's not up to random chance. That's one answer, but we don't care about that, right? We only care about the number of mistakes. Yes. And has the potential to eliminate the most functions by keeping the, with the most functions that agree with each other to pass. Well, There's no chance. I don't know. Okay. Uh, Jacob. Every time you eliminate any, you have to pass. It's more than the same thing. That's right. I'll repeat that. The prediction is the majority label. And if the majority label is wrong, you're going to remove all of them. You're going to, what is all of them? You're going to remove at least half of the functions because there can be a majority only if half of them are same plus uh, one, say for instance. If it predicts one and the label is wrong, that means we know at least half the functions predicted one and they all get removed. So at a, when a mistake happens, you are pruning the set by at least half. The next time you'll prune it by half again. So at each mistake, you are cutting out half of the functions. Whereas with con, at each mistake, in the worst case, you will remove only one function. And does this seem familiar? Logarithmic. It's logarithmic. In fact, while I did not introduce it this way, con is basically like linear search in a list. Halving is like binary search. So how many mistakes will... Uh, the halving algorithm makes. Let's prove it. Let's take a let's prove this. Suppose it makes n mistakes. We're going to see how what how how bad could n be. Suppose suppose it makes n mistakes, which means we'll be left with a set of functions p n that contains only one element. The algorithm stops, and there's only one element in the set. So we'll be left with a set of functions that has one element. So the size of c n equals one. There's only one element in the thing. Let's think about how Cn came into existence. So let's say Cn has the function f3. Let's consider the set C n minus one before Cn came into existence. Maybe C n minus one consisted of one, f2. And when the example was when the example came in for the example x, some example, f1 predicted a 1, this one predicted a 1, this was a 0, and this was a 1. And here, clearly, the label 1 is the majority label, so 1 gets predicted. So a majority of the functions get erased when there's a mistake. By majority, I mean at least half of the functions. That means the size of Cn is less than half the size of Cn minus one, right? This is the only sort of technical piece here and everything else is just a repetition of this. So any questions? Yeah. 
Okay. It can never remove the true function. It can never remove the true function because it will keep all the elements that agree with the true function. It will keep every function that agrees with the true function, which means it can the true function always agrees with the true function. So it can't remove the true function. You don't look happy, so I want you to ask me more questions. No? Okay. Yes. It could, if there are multiple functions that um, are always correct. If there are multiple, uh, meaning that there are multiple copies of the same function, essentially. Yeah. Or uh, something like that. So it could enter that, but for now we are pretending that every function is uh, um, th there's no repetition. Um, I'm not missing, but how do we know that function is within or uh, Because of this, we are making that assumption. Just making that assumption. <laughs> yes. um, we are, in particular, we are making the following assumption. We are assuming that the concept class and the hypothesis class are identical. The concept class is this sort of a imaginary set of functions that contains the two functions. The hypothesis class is a set of functions that are learner explores. And just to make our life easy, we are assuming these two things are the same. Okay, so at, at the very end, Cn, the size of number of elements in Cn will be less than or uh, it's not less than or equal to, but it's strictly less than because you've eliminated at least one function because there was a mistake. You've definitely eliminated at least one function. So the, the size of Cn will be less than half the size of Cn minus one. But Cn minus one came into existence because a mistake happened with Cn minus two and an update was triggered. So I can apply the same argument again. The size of Cn minus 1 is less than half the size of Cn minus 2, which is less than half the size of Cn minus 3. And I can keep going till eventually there will, how many mistakes are made? I'm assuming that there are n mistakes. At n mistakes, after at the very beginning, we started off with the entire set of functions. So this whole thing is less than 1 over, at every point, we are multiplying by a half. So after two mistakes, we have one over two power two. After n mistakes, we times c n minus two. After n mistakes, we have one over two power n size of c zero. C zero was the set of functions we started off with, which is simply the set of functions, all the functions we have. Okay. So let's now take the first and the last step and combine them. Just move the two power n to the other side. We know that. Uh, the size of C is greater than 2 power n. I just rearrange this thing. I can take log on both sides. So I get log of the size of C is greater than n. And let's say it's log to the base 2. Who cares? Okay. Actually, we are done. Because what was n? n is simply the number of mistakes. And here I'm saying, n is less than log of the size of c. So the number of mistakes is bounded on top by log of size of c. Mm -hmm. So no matter what the true function is, this algorithm will not make more than log times three mistakes. And that's our bound. The halving algorithm will make no more than log of size of c mistakes. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yeah. That is a wonderful question. The question was, all of this is nice. I'm just kind of paraphrasing what you said. All of this is nice. You know, you have a log and all that, but hey, I'm enumerating every function and I'm enumerating the prediction of every function in the set at every step. Doesn't seem particularly efficient, right? It's not. 
This is that's why I said this is a proof of concept algorithm. If I find any of you trying to implement the halving algorithm, I'll be disappointed. Uh, because you know, just try it. Try it. Why not? Uh, you're going to enumerate sets of functions and it's not going to end well. Yes. Um, this may not be a good question, but um, have you gone over what those functions are going to look like yet? Or... No, we haven't. I'm just assuming some abstract set of functions. Uh, but the important point is it's a finite set. So, having algorithm is hard to compute. It's ridiculously inefficient, so don't go around implementing it. However, for certain types of concept classes, having is actually optimal in a provable sense. What that means, in particular for Boolean functions, optimal means for the most difficult concept in the class of functions, for the worst sequence of examples, no other algorithm, even the most, even an efficient uh, algorithm is going to, cannot make fewer mistakes than having. Having represents the best possible mistake bound. The log of size of C is the best possible mistake bound on all Boolean functions. It does not have to be the algorithm that you would implement because you can't implement it. But this is a theoretical minimum. You can't do better than this. Uh, actually, there's like a different definition of optimal that is even harder to compute, which is not about making mistakes, counting the number of mistakes, but counting the number of possible future mistakes, which requires us to compute some crazy expectations that we really can't actually estimate. But uh, that's, uh, that, that's not gonna, let's not go there. So quickly sum up the having algorithm. It's a simple algorithm, at least conceptually, for finite concept classes, where at every step, you keep it keeps in memory the set of all hypotheses that are still consistent with all the examples that have been seen so far. The any online or any mistake driven algorithm needs two functions to be defined. One of them is how you make a prediction, and the second one is how you make an update if there's a mistake. Having makes its prediction by asking every function in the hypothesis so far, in the hypothesis class so far, what's the label and picking the most common label. It makes an update if there's a mistake by discarding all the functions that made a mistake and keeping only the ones that are correct. And as a result, at every step, whenever there's a mistake, it reduces the size of the, uh, the set by at least a half. And you just uh, you know iteratively continue this process and you can easy to show that it makes no more than log of size of C number of mistakes. Um, that last point is a technical point that I, I don't want to get into right now because uh, it uh, sort of foreshadows the perceptron algorithm. Let's not go there. Yeah. Instead, um, let's look at uh, some examples of how we might apply the results that we saw here. So now we need to actually define the set of functions. So let's pick a set of functions, a set of all possible conjunctions. So a conjunction is the number of, is, is a Boolean function that takes, uh, imagine you have n features, a conjunction might be something like x1 and x2 and not x3. You are allowed to use negation. So this is saying the output is true if x1 is true and x2 is true and x3 is not true. The set of conjunctions is all functions of this type. Okay. So that's the set C. The only thing that matters for having and for con is the size of C. So how many conjunctions, how many conjunctions exist? This is a sort of a neat puzzle. How many conjunctions can exist? What's the size of C? There's one suggestion that's two power n. How did you get there? Because I use for arrow size, I use an O. Oh. No, no, three. So we use one. There's another suggestion. So we do that. Three to the end. Yeah. <laughs> yes. There's another suggestion. Two power. Two power n. Is two power n off the table? Keep it. And let's apply the having algorithm. How many people think it is two power n? One person. How many people think it's three power n? 
You proposed it. At least you must. <laughs> I changed. I changed. You changed your mind? Yeah. Okay. How many people think two power, two powers? Two people. So the majority is two power, two power. It turns out actually the answer is three power n. <laughs> oh, I, I like this. I like the real surprise that you have. This is awesome. Let me prove it to you. So there are n, n uh, features, right? And they're all Boolean. Let me construct a conjunction. The way I might construct a conjunction is, let's say there are, let's say n equals four. There are four slots. And I'm going to put an and between all of them. For the first slot, I could choose to put an x1, or I could choose to put a not x1, or I could say x1 is not even in this mm. conjunction. So maybe I, I'm going to put true, true to just indicate x1 is not part of this conjunction. Mm. For the second slot, I could choose to put x2 or not x2 or true. x2 means this. So I'll show you an example. Here I could put x3, not x3 or true, x4, not x4 or true. And so, for instance, I can say if I took put a not x1 here and a true, not x3 and an x4, my conjunction is not x1 and not x3 and x4. Would you agree that I can construct by choosing one item in each list yes. independently, I can construct any possible conjunction? I see some heads nodding. I don't see the other heads moving. So, ask me a question. Oh, that's just a that's just a way of saying that particular feature is not going to feature in the conjunction. So, by choosing true here, that's just by choosing this here. Notice, I did not put an x. Here. So, what we have here is we have. Instead of four, we have n possible slots to fill. Each slot can be independently filled by one of three things. So I can choose three things here, three here, three here, all the way to, and I multiply all of them, and I get three power n. The size of the set of the number of conjunctions that exist and the number of disjunctions that exist is three power n. Let's apply the halving bound. The halving algorithm will make log of size of C, which is log of to the base two of three power F, which is simply N, right? What's a constant between strengths? So let's just call this O of N. <laughs> so the number of mistakes it makes is linear in the dimensionality, in the number of uh, uh, features that exist. What, what, what this means, is let's go back to the definition of mistake bound. The mistake uh, a concept is said to be a mistake bound algorithm. Oh, sorry, a concept is said to be learnable under the mistake bound model if there exists at least one algorithm that makes no more than a polynomial number of mistakes in the number of features. There exists one algorithm, namely halving, that can make a linear number of mistakes in the dimensionality. That means the set of conjunctions is learnable under the mistake bound model. Halving is a lousy algorithm. You should never implement it. But the definition did not say that it should be a good algorithm. It just says there needs to be at least one algorithm. So conjunctions are learnable under the mistake bound model. It turns out for conjunction, there's also a practical algorithm that can learn the uh, concept with the, with the same mistake bound. And this is the elimination algorithm that we saw in the last lecture. Halving is not uh, efficient. Elimination is efficient. Uh, to kind of trigger your uh, memory, this was the slide that was there that described the elimination algorithm, which removed all the examples that have a negative label, and then took only the common features that are active in all the positive examples. So that's the, uh, that's the halving algorithm. Uh, sorry, that's the uh, case for conjunction. Let's now consider the case of something called K conjunctions. K conjunctions are a different set of functions. Um, what K conjunctions, the way you construct them is there may be N features in the data, but every function that nature is allowed to choose has to first pick K of them 
and call them the relevant features because they are, you know, they might be irrelevant features, and make a conjunction out of it. Does this construction make sense? So if I say a two conjunction, a two conjunction can only have any concept in the set of two, two conjunctions can have only two features. So it can be a conjunction of only two features that are chosen. So for instance, x1 and not x2 is a two-two conjunction. x1 is not a true two conjunction because it's missing out on the second feature. Similarly, x1 and x2 and x3 is not a two conjunction because it's using three features. There may be a million features, but only two of them show up in any context. That's a two conjunction. We play the same game once again. We count the number of two conjunctions. So given any concept class, you need to count how many functions exist. And the number of two conjunctions, it turns out, is 2 power k n choose k. Can someone tell me why? Someone else. Can someone else tell me why? <laughs> yes. We start with uh, with n choose k, but we start with n possible in the future, and then each time we have another future, we have n minus one, and we still don't have to see the result steps. Where did two to the k come from? Two to the k. Oh, yeah. Don't have explanation for that. Okay. Uh, we are choosing uh, k x's out of your set. Yes. Here, and choose k comes from, and then two to the k is the impossible states that each of those x's can be as normal x to the k or not. That's right. So remember, a k conjunction is constructed by choosing k features out of the n features or k variables out of the n variables. So how, how many different ways can you choose k things out of n things? It is n choose k. Now you've got a set of k features that are relevant. Each feature can has to show up in the conjunction, but it has the option of showing up by itself, like this x1, or it can come attached to the negation. So there are two possible things that you can do for each feature. All of them have to show up, but either it has to show up by itself or negated. So there are two possible states that that feature can exist in. So that's why you get the two power k. And you know, without too much, uh, uh, if, if, if all we care about is the big O notation, I can approximate that thing as two power k and power k. I'm not going to tell you why. I encourage you to think about it. Uh, the reason I do that is because I'm going to take log. Why do I take log? Because I want the mistake bound for the halving algorithm. So if I take log of 2 power k n power k, I get order of k log n. k log n versus order of n. If I know that the number of features is fixed, the number of relevant features is only k, halving makes only logarithmic number of mistakes in the dimensionality. Mm -hmm. And this is related to the previous question about uh, number of relevant features. It only makes a, a, a logarithmic in the dimensionality is actually ridiculously small. Log of a million is a very small number. Log of 1000 to the base 2 is 10. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So, if this halving is a mistake bound algorithm that makes that is strongly dependent, linearly dependent on the number of relevant features and only weakly dependent on the number of actual features, the dimensionality. So that's a fantastic property to have, but having is not efficient. So the natural question is, just like with conjunctions, can there exist a learning algorithm that can efficiently learn with only these many number of mistakes? You cannot do better than this because having is optimal. So the only thing that's left is, can we do, can, can we at least match this bound? We have how much time left? We have a minute left, so I'm not going to answer that question. Uh, we'll pick up on um, Tuesday, where, where I'll answer that question and use that answer as a motivation to introduce the perceptron algorithm. Um, there will be a homework on Canvas. Check it out whenever you can come. What about the 